spelled A E, Eterna. Uh, so, uh, yes, Michael. So, why is it that first the Greeks had this great intellectual and civic, all these great accomplishments, and then the Romans had these great civic and uh, physical accomplishments? What was it about the time and the place? You know, there are many other parts of the world that have little islands, other parts of the world that have you know, a city on a hill. What was it about those times and those places? Okay, the question is what is so special about Greeks and what is so special about Romans? They're clearly special. Nobody, I mean, we cannot deny it. It's, it's sort of one of the basic facts. I mean, nothing I told you could be argued. I mean, yes, Rome, Rome created a great empire. Why them? Uh, let's start with Greece, as you did. There are, and here we have to always remember that there are reason in histories. There are laws in histories, but they're subtle. They're not physical laws. We cannot explain everything. Yes, Greeks had certain things nobody else at the time had, meaning a bunch of little states speaking the same language, sharing fundamentally the same religion or variants of the same religion, having the same literature, Homer. There are no other case like that. It just so happens I cannot point. Uh, but of course you say, why did they get Homer? That I do not know. Right? I, you know I, I, cannot, I cannot explain why Greeks somehow had a unifying literature which sort of created this notion of community even they were different states. It's hard for me to explain Athenian greatness. Right? There is this speech, you remember the speech by Pericles, you say that Athens is the school of Greece. And so it is. And it's actually the school of the world till today. A classical Athens, not the Athens of today, maybe. But you know, it is an amazing, it is an am truly amazing thing. Could I, could I quite explain? No, nobody can. Nobody can. I have to, to get to Rome. There is something amazing about Romans. This is a combination of two things which I do not find in anyone. They are extremely organizational. Like Greeks are not, never were. During in Athens or now and never will be, and this is the greatness of Greeks. Right? They're not bureaucrats. Romans are bureaucrats. They were bureaucrats. They loved order. Right? They loved the laws, obedience to the laws, the rules. Sort of that was the nature of the Roman Empire. And then they had something again which I never encounter in any other group. This is a victorious empire. They conquer everyone. And then they're conquered by the conquered. I mean, the Greeks conquer Romans. The Greek civilization dominates its conquerors. These are people who have enough, in spite of their military prowess, in spite of their ability to destroy anyone, or at least for centuries, and, and they, they just destroy everyone on their path. They recognize the greatness of Greek culture to a degree that most educated or upper class Romans uh, read and write Greek fluently to a degree that when a Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, I talked about, wants to write a book on philosophy, he writes in Greek. 
this is not the only case, but it's, you know, it's like from Sisera till well into the uh, third century, fundamentally a Roman intellectual is required to know Greek fluently. They're required to know it, but they don't advance, say, mathematics and the sciences, which, which seems odd. The question is, why don't they advance sciences and mathematics and arts and philosophy? Actually, you could go across the board. This is another amazing historical thing which happens time and time again. It's not just there. If we take, okay, if we ignore Greece, the greatest cultural explosion in the history of the world, I know, is the Florentine Renaissance. Yes. There, is not, I mean, there is nothing more amazing than this little place, again, it's like that Athens is a little place, which produces people like Dante and Fra Angelica and Michelangelo. I could go on. Now, what is so amazing? What is amazing is that, and then it stops. When does it stop? When they are conquered by some barbarians? No. When they finally get peace and quiet, in the middle of 16th century, there come a period of what is known as Medici Dukes, a very benevolent, paternalistic sort of rulers who protect the culture. They build great museums. They decide to preserve all the great art. They employ great writers to write books about great artists. One thing is missing. The new great art. It stops. Why? I don't know. This is a paradoxical thing. I see throughout sort of another miraculous thing is for those of us who love music is of course this city of Vienna. Again, the music there starts with people like Haydn, then it goes Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, and Brahms, who, who is not actually Viennese but arrives there, Mahler, and then it stops. I know about second Viennese school, but it effectively stops with Mahler's death in 1911. There is this afterthought of sort of uh, Schoenberg, Berg, and Weber, but no, not quite. It stops. Yes. To, to address some of the points around uh, you know why this place, uh, I think it's important to uh, address the advancement of technology along with the advancement of civilization in that these were places in the world that had uh, metals, uh, that metallurgy was uh, advancing rapidly and, and allowed for the kind of weapons and uh, military domination that goes with creating uh, centers uh, that brings people together, brings slaves. Technology uh, as the driver for these things. It's a wonderful theory. This is what Karl Marx believed. But the facts are totally against it. Romans, who ruled the world, did not advance technology. The development of technology stops with Greeks at the third century BC. But perhaps uh, the application of, of these technologies that were, that were uh, uh, discovered by others, but that the aqueduct, for example, uh, to bring water. Uh, but aqueducts was an ancient technology in terms what was possible, I mean, the first amazing constructions like that go to the 6th century. Greek could do it. They didn't, but they could. Roman engineering, yes, I remember. Uh, Roman engineering is quite amazing, but it's secondary. And let me tell you, in great degree, we live in this place which supposedly great, sort of we have 
Apple and Google and Facebook and other amazing advanced things. But we actually haven't invented anything. Right? So that if all the fundamental science was invented by English and French and Germans, yeah, it was sort of done by when? You know, 1930. This is not a great scientific place. We haven't got anything to show. Right? But we build, and how long will it last? I don't know. But Rome was able to do amazing things for 600 years without any advances in science and fundamental technology. That's 600 years. No advances in technology. That's what I claim. It was a decline from, I mean, it's basically when Archimedes is killed, this is the easiest way of sort of saying, the advance of technology is over. No, they use it. Of course they use it. I mean, our, our bureaucratic and military organization innovation is not technological in that sense. So, you know, like the Marian military reforms, and then, yeah, I mean, the, this, this continues throughout the empire as you have, you know, some, um, you know, some challenge in the organization and whoever's empire, emperor, if they're successful, fix it, fixes the problem and, and, and moves on, whether it's the fiction or... Um, military technology. And the sort of the amazing thing that Rome so that he has this certain military technology, uh, say in 300 BC, you know, they, and then they successfully conquer the world without inventing a stirrup, something which would give them a you know stirrup. To, so, uh, so it's it's not clear how important that is. Organization, yes, but it's still old. Well, but, but no, but it, it, it evolves. I mean, the, the reason that they're able to beat the Greeks is they say, okay, you know, hoplites are great on hills, but we don't have as many hills here, so we're going to form... Um, no, hoplites are not great at hills. Plains, they're, they're the other they're, way around. They're, they're, they're good at plains, they're not great on hills. Um, and we have hills in central Italy, so we need to come up with something else. Um, and, I mean, they keep coming up with different systems. Like I think... Yeah, they do. Um, I mean, they're not... Legion becomes a fairly standard. They establish the size. The size is roughly 5,000. The partition of the legion into centuria and so on. I mean, it's fairly stable for hundreds and hundreds of years. The training is pretty much the same. The term of service, 20 years, is pretty much the same. I don't see much innovation. I mean, I mean it changes radically uh, in the time of Marius, and then it changes radically again. Does it change radically the time of matters? It does change radically the time of matters. How does it? Um, in terms of formation, in terms of the actual, like, who is bringing the equipment. So before Marius, everyone brings their own equipment. And then after Marius, essentially the state is providing the equipment. Yes, but it's the same equipment. Well, but I mean, so it's, it's an organization. Kind of thing. So yes, 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 yes. And then eventually they start paying money. Instead of, yes, that changes. But when you look at the Roman legion, I do not see much of a change. This is a very stable system. And it lives and lives and lives and lives. Yes? Um, does an empire have to be expansionist? Because I see ancient ah. Egypt, I see China, they do not have colonies. They Sometimes they organize you know, uh, like military raids and uh, pillage the other countries, but they do not establish colonies. China is a amazing. Does an empire have to be an expansionist? Um, in the West, apparently, yes. Uh, sort of most of the European empires, or Western empires, are. Um, it's hard, you know. I have to. I have to go back to the first lecture. The, the fundamental mindset of, say, China as an empire is different. 
This is, you know, so far China has been a non-aggressive country. No matter, don't, don't read the newspapers what they say. It's a non-aggressive country. They have been viewing the rest of the world as backward barbarians, and their only desire is to keep them out. They want the wall, right? This is now, I mean, Romans, at some point, start doing the same. They, they really turn into sort of, that's our world, the rest is out of darkness, and it was. And the expansion stops. It's not clear in case of Rome whether expansion stops because they don't want to expand or expansion stops because they can no longer expand and barely survive themselves. That I cannot tell. But obviously, Western societies are much more aggressive historically than, say, China. I mean, they're not, I mean, India is a civilization, but it's not an empire. Uh, Mongolians were not a civilization, <laughs> and it was not an empire. It was a, you know, just army on the move, burning and pillaging and doing things like that. And the amazing thing about China is that they managed to integrate Mongolians into their civilization and empire. Sort of, they're conquered, but they taught, I mean, you know, couple of generations, they're the same Han Chinese as in spite of being Mongolians. The same examination system. So China, again, I have no time, no actually qualification to lecture on China. But every time when I attempt to study Chinese civilization, it's different. You know, whatever, whatever things we, we know about Western civilization do not apparently work there. It's, it's a different society. Right? And this is, this is why I, I sort of view with sort of every time they say, oh, China wants to be an imperialist. I don't know. They've never been. Could they become? Anything is possible. I mean, we don't know the future. But so far, what I see that China remains within the same sort of pattern, civilizational pattern, as they have been for at least 2,200 years. There are arguments when Chinese civilization really starts, but, you know, we... I want to go back to the Romans. Um, and I'd like to contrast the Romans uh, with the Greeks, where language was the same. They viewed, them sa they viewed themselves as belonging to, you know, the Greek world. Romans? No, the Greeks. Yes. And they had a common enemy, Persia. For a while. Which allowed them to define themselves as, you know, as, as, yes. a, as a nation rather than city-states. What was the counterpart of that in the Roman world? What, what is it that held the fabric together? Fear. They, they were, what was the, what, okay, Nicholas's question is that Greeks were able to see themselves as Greeks only when attacked by Persia. So what was that for Rome? Rome was always under attack. That's the, I, mean, I mean, when you read early history of Rome, they're always under attack. Gauls, Etruscans, I mean, name it. They're constant attack. So let me finish. So. This, however, is the Roman depiction of their enormous and very fast expansion. So we're peaceful people. We never touch anyone. And at the end, we rule this huge empire because it just fell into our lap. <laughs> that is truly how Romans view the world, by the way. Sort of, we're a peaceful nation. We just hope, I mean, they have this, a uh, uh, temple which has doors open when uh, there is a state of war. And it's been closed for like three years. Uh, the war is always on because there are always some bad people who need democracy. 
So they go and give them democracy or what, whatever, civilization. So they keep expanding and expanding and expanding because just they have no choice. Because how could, I mean, there's these Egyptians, they, they clearly cannot rule themselves. And, you know, they could, you know, it affects the grain trade. It's, yeah, grain was very important. Cheap grain could come from there. And nobody, it makes no economic sense to grow grain in Italy. We want free market so that Egyptians grow grain and we grow olives because it's much more profitable for us. So, therefore, we conquer Egypt. You know, actually, one interesting thing is that after the fall of the Roman Empire, yes. land was totally devastated. Nothing. After the fall of Roman Empire, the land was devastated. Yes, indeed. In, in Italy, yes, especially around Rome. The drainage. So, so my question was, Greeks view themselves as Greeks. Roman citizens, uh, people in the Roman Empire, and my claim is that not all of them view themselves as Romans. Uh, it depends when, by, say, you know, uh, the end of the third century, they all viewed themselves as Romans because they all got the citizenship. At the moment you got the citizenship, you immediately started viewing yourself as Roman. It was a good, it's like, yeah, it's like here, you become, a, you get American passport, you know, you become an American, you have to do, you know, 4th of July, your national holiday, you know, you know the, the rest. Yeah. You know, the parallel is very good. Uh, but I, I want to come back to, actually to very early, to uh, how you define civilization. And uh, there is this parallel between, you know, cultural stuff, literature, music, and so on, and more material parts of uh, civilization. And the, the distance between Greece and Rome is very clear, right? Greeks don't have that much material stuff. They are essentially Did poor. Uh, while, while Romans, as you pointed out, basically achieve a 19th century standard of living, if not better. 20th century. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so how does this actually um, come into the very definition of what civilization is and uh, relation? Because Again, the Roman civilization is essentially a material civilization. They are very pragmatic. They are super pragmatic. Yes, Roman civilization uh, is a material. Yes. But, but super pragmatic. So, so how does this, uh, again, coming back to what civilization actually is and what barbarians are? Because from a Roman point of view, it's kind of having running water, right? I mean. Having running water. and. <laughs> And the safe roads? So the question is, I don't know what the question is actually. So, so uh, uh, the question is, what is, what is civilization? That is the question. So, so in the light of this, because again, when you started, you talked about Homer and the, you know, the common, if you want, set of cultural values. That's why some would say it's a Greek or Roman. Well, okay, so what is civilization? What, let, let, me, let me restate my original definition. My definition is the set of common beliefs and ideas which allow people to live together. Right? That is why it is essential, because if you have certain ideas, then you actually create the material world. I mean, maybe not iPhones, but you know, fundamentally, the moment you sort of decide in your mind that law and order is good, you start creating, and this is unusual idea. M many parts of the world never had this idea. The idea is whatever the boss says. It's not the law. It's the, what the boss says. So 
you know, we have to, we have to, we have to, I, I would actually claim, in spite of the sort of 150 years of Marxist propaganda, that material conditions determine what we believe. I claim it's the other way around. That is, if you have the correct mindset, or certain mindset, not to, you would create the corresponding conditions. Right? Part of the problem is that, which we see in many parts of the world, is that they do not share these fundamental presuppositions. You know, when, when somebody decides, let's go and build democracy in Afghanistan, and we'll help them build the roads and things like that, nothing happens. You cannot somehow create good material conditions in Afghanistan, however many billions you put in there. Because the mind of the people there, and I'm not trying to say they're worse than us, but for sure they're different. It's not, you know, they, it's not that they cannot think about it. I mean, modern civilization, Western civilization does not really require such in great intellectual accomplishment from an average person. Look around. Right? So, but nevertheless, nevertheless, you cannot bring Afghans to that. I see major problems. No matter, again, in, uh, you know, I don't want to name countries, but when I travel, when I see things, I often see that, no, they, I mean, you know, they, they have educated people. They have many what, what you think like that. But fundamentally, the notion of, of law and order is not in their mind. I actually claim that the foundation of, for example, Roman civilization is this law and order notion. Yes. Is the 12 Caesars really the best exemplar of Roman law and order? <clears throat> is 12 Caesars the best example of law and order? Uh, no. I specifically described what it is the best example. Uh, the problem is, you know, could you study Justinian's uh, code? No, it's not a realistic, realistic thing for me to to suggest. We will get again we, as as we progress. We will cover again not every, for example. You know, music was central to Greek society. Observe, I didn't talk about music at all. Why? Because the music which forms our civilization is fundamentally, I'm going to shock people, is German. It's just, that is how it is, whether we like it or not. The notion of sort of music, well, I do not include Lady Gaga in, into to that. It's fundamentally a German thing. So whatever, yes, I know it goes back to Gregorian chant and to therefore, uh, you know, maybe some Greek chant and certainly some Hebrew chant, but it's not, I mean, it's for academics. For a normal person, you should start with Bach. By the way, I do love Renaissance polyphony, but you should start with Bach. Bach is not Renaissance. So you had your chance. Yeah, uh, in the middle you mentioned that there are uh, later attempts by others to inherit or claim inheritance to the Roman Empire and try to rebuild Roman Empire. My question is, uh, you mentioned Han Dynasty and, and in China, um, sort of even after the fall of Han, Han Dynasty, there were succeeding dynasties and even when they were in warring states, it was temp considered temporary and people both from the emperor to the, the citizens have this tendency to you know always claim a reunion and claim that we should always reunite and then there's peace and let's build an empire uh, why do you think such attempts have all failed uh, in europe since roman empire 
Okay, let's look at China there. Then we will see what China, so the question is why China succeeded in having empire till now, uh, while the West failed. First of all, West, remember from my point of view, empire lasted till 1453, which is fairly recent. Now, China had something which Europe did not have. It had an educated bureaucracy with a very precise educational system, which included education, examination, promotion, and so, which basically 2,000 years old. And this is the system which made China, in some sense, reject progress. But that's also the system which made China historically the most stable place on Earth. I mean, there's these periodic revolutions, but they're still the same class. Mandarins are the same. You know, dynasties come and go, but the educated Europe never managed to create that. Right? Sort of, it's, China is a unique model. In many respects, I'm going to say it nevertheless, it's very attractive. From the point of view, again, for an average person, stability is much more important than progress. Don't, I know it's very heretical thing to say, but if you're an average human being, what you want, you want no wars, no revolutions. You want steady supply of rice constantly coming. That's what you want. The moment it breaks, this is terrible. People start dying. So China, on, on overall, probably had the most prosperous society till it starts encountering the West in 19th century, which start destroying the the Chinese system. China was a happy place. So a follow-up question to that. So you're saying the meritocracy in China is fundamental to it. But what about, for example, as Nicholas was pointing out earlier, that the, the, the feel of citizenship or the belonging uh, to the civilization uh, what I meant is, if I look at modern Europe right now, for example, because I, I just haven't read too much into the, the past Europe, um, I see people, for example, the French consider themselves French before they're Europeans, whereas a province in China, they consider themselves Chinese, and then they're... Cantonese over there. Uh, do you think that plays a role? Yes. Yes. But don't forget, I mean, one, as we will progress through European history, we will see that European civilization is fundamentally revolutionary. They are like every hundred years, something or the other thing. That we will get, when we get to closer, we will get to this Hobbesbaum theory of short century, long century, short century, long century. Basically, every hundred years, there is something completely new. You know, Renaissance, Reformation, Baroque, I mean, it changes every hundred years. So, is it good? For many people, it wasn't as good as it sounds. Right? Uh, Europe is the only place where you could talk about things like hundred-year-old war. Right? Sort of think about it. Hundred years of continuous, basically, there are some interruptions of war, which covers most of France at that time, the, the most civilized part of, of Europe, where our dear English friends are marching through and uh, sort of destroying all the infrastructure and doing all kinds of terrible things. 100 years. So, and then there are revolutions. I mean, Europe is unstable. And this is part of our heritage. We have to remember that. So every every year there's I mean just every year there's something or another thing. Except the Dark Age. Except the Dark Age. The Dark Ages are while they are in many respects dark, but there is no stability. This is not China. 
you know, when Danes come, you know, this is no stability, Danes and other Normans, right? So, you know, it's highly unstable. They're constant, constant change. It's not war, it's change, right? It's this, and is it good? I mean, you know, in history, we have to, at some point, abandon good, bad. We have to look what is. So we are heirs in the West of this highly volatile, unstable world. We will see. I mean, we're not done. You know, there, there'll come sort of European religious tradition. We will start seeing it. Yes. Um, even within the Roman Empire and you know, in the Republic, the, we had these civil war after civil war after civil war. You know, every time some emperor died, you'd have a civil war. Essentially, I mean, not. There are period of peace. There is this period from, uh, say, uh, 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 Tarjan till the uh, end of uh, Marcus Aurelius. This period of good emperors, about hundred years of peace and prosperity. Of course, the next guy who comes is Commodus, and that is. As terrible as yeah. the century of that, and, yeah. and then you know, periodically after that, you have something. So it's not. Yes, it's pretty awful. Yeah, I know. It, it predates the, and yeah, you know, the Roman Empire. The the. Yes, 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 yes. It go. I mean, look at the Greeks. You know, where the, there is a constant, you know, there is fighting and change and cultural shift and philosophical shifts. And of course, it happens in Rome. Yes, it's not, I mean, Europe is, is never at peace with itself. Right? Yes? Uh, going back to the technology um, uh, discussion. So, you know, in computer science, we know that if, if you have a problem that grows 10 times in size, it often requires a different solution. So, Roman uh, Empire, in order to be able to control larger and larger territory for longer and longer time. I don't, maybe that's the technology had to invent you know, a different kind of bureaucracy that could sustain itself for a longer period of time or a different type of infrastructure that could scale to larger areas. So uh, while you know, Alexander could conquer this uh, huge territory, it, it wasn't sustainable for some reason. So what is the technological foundation for controlling? You see, the, for controlling large territory, if you study Roman Empire, what you realize is how dramatically different Roman Empire is from itself. For example, it's a very, the second century Roman Empire is extremely stable place. There is just they control everything very well. It's managed very well, very good administration. Uh, just things are good. And then starts the third century. And it's a nightmare. Right? They can no longer control anything. Everything collapses till the, almost the very end, when they had to, to do total political change and from what is now a principate, where there is the traditional Roman emperor is not actually an emperor, he is just, you know, first citizen. Yeah? I mean, he's, and there, there are many things. And then by the end of the third century, when it seems that the empire will crumble completely, uh, Diocletian comes with a totally revolutionary change uh, from Principat to what is known as Dominant. He is now a Dominus. He's a, the Lord of the Empire. It's Oriental monarchy. So suddenly, you have to prostrate yourself. This is un unheard of. He becomes an Oriental monarch, builds a totally different sort of system. And even Christian emperors, such as Constantine, the first Christian emperor, they fundamentally, these Oriental monarchs, sort of the model shifts. 
that thing went. But what I am saying is that Roman Empire changed several times. By the way, I started with the second century, but there was a period, again, there was this dramatic shift in the middle of the first century, too, because it was very clear, sort of, the original system established by Augustus by the time of Nero was crumbling. A totally new system had to be invented for a while by uh, uh, Flavius and, you know, all the uh, Titus and Domitian established sort of a somewhat different system, which again then crumbles. Sort of there are multiple revolutions and interregnums. I mean, this is why this is a good book because it shows how unstable Rome is. By the way, you you will grant me that it does show that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, it doesn't show you the the legal the the amazing fact which you do not see in Roman historians is that what you see is the em the emperors. What you do not see is municipal courts, which are pretty much stable. There is some progress in, in Roman law, but it's much more stable. If you lived in Lyon, you were in a much more stable place than you lived in Rome, because there were no revolutions in Lyon. I mean, I pick, pick another place, if you like. That, that was sort of my point about the 12 Caesars, is that you, know, you get you know, uh, Tiberius and Liga and acting in totally arbitrary fashion. But these are the stories which people remember. <laughs> okay? Yes, I could recommend Momsen instead, and you will learn a deeper and broader picture, but you will never finish him. And Momsen was a great German historian of Roman, Roman Empire. No, 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 read this. So not read, I mean, again, what I'm trying to, to do, I'm trying to only suggest realistic books. You know, I, I'm pretty certain that any of you could start and, more importantly, finish. This is a book one could finish because it's, it's a page turner with all the sex and violence. You know, you couldn't, I mean, you know, what is this Fifty Shades of... I don't know what's the number. What's the, how many shades? Fifth. So I have 50 shades of gray. This is nothing. This is the real stuff. So, you know, but, but you could read it and you will get some fundamental stories. You would know what Nero said when they came to kill him. Anybody knows? What the great, I mean, is dying. So this is very important. Right? So there are certain things in this book which everybody, by the way, everybody historian will, every historian nowadays will tell, or Tacitus is far greater. How many manuscripts of Tacitus do we have? Anybody knows? Oh, it's a very easy question. Uh, one, and it's lost. Okay. Sort of the, through the Middle Ages, this was copied a lot. Tacitus was not. Why? Because it's page turning. This, you are a lonely monk. You're sitting in the <laughs> monastery. You know, somebody gives you that. I mean, you copy it fast. Yeah, I mean, you know. It's true. How do I know? Because we have lots of this. And none of relatively boring but deep Tacitus. Again, sort of, there is this natural attrition. Again, it defines, in many respects, it defines a form of a biography. Again, you say, what about Plutarch? Well, you see, Plutarch tells you good things. Remember when Hernan asked me, so what, why do I recommend Plutarch? I say, because he tells you about good about human. This doesn't tell you anything good. It tells you how weird and disgusting people are. Right? Especially people in power. A very important message, I think. Right? Sort of, 
and no exception. He picks 12, it's like, you know, 12 guys and they're one worse than the other, I mean, some much worse than the others, but it's, you know, it's not that any of them are particularly appealing. And you, you get, so, and again, I, I still want to tell you, this is, this is a page turner. You will enjoy it. There are more important books. Where do we get our copies of Tacitus that we have now? I mean, you can go and get or, No, 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 history. Where do they, I mean, after one manuscript was discovered, it was immediately printed. You know, all these Renaissance guys were, they were hunting every monastery for surviving manuscripts. So after it was printed, this manuscript got lost. So this, the, so this is it. We haven't got, I mean, what is the textual criticism of Tacitus? None, right? In case of Homer, we have multiple, multiple, multiple things. In case of the Bible, you wouldn't believe how many. Very minor, but nevertheless, variations. Here we have, I mean, not here, but in Tacitus, we, we have just one, Thing. What? For, uh, there was, for a while we know, there was a manuscript. manuscript. Yes. But now we haven't got any. So, I mean, it's gone. Lost. Irretrievably. Right? So, it's, it's this. We will be talking about Tacitus in the next lecture because, again, we'll start talking about the Jews and Tacitus gives the sort of, if you want to see how Romans thought of the Jews, you have to read Tacitus, because that's the only. Uh, you might not like what you read, but that's the only picture from the outside which, which we have. Josephus is not from the outside. Uh, so, um, I'll talk about Josephus too. So, but, uh, so again, the, the, what, 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 look, I, I have to, it's a very tough thing. For example, this is not my favorite Roman book, by the way, personally. I mean, it is very entertaining, but, you know, in terms of what I, I repeat, the most out of classical Romans, uh, for me, Seneca is the one I most often turn. If, if just the, the number of times I pull the book from the shelf, for Seneca is much, much more often than this. This, you know. Uh, but I do not recommend Seneca. I have, to, I have to make choices. It's again, you know, every choice is, is a choice. It's, every choice is a wrong choice. Because if I say read this, I tell you not to read that. Okay? Now you could go. <laughs>